Welcome to the Strategy Mob Podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, 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 what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me another episode of Strategy Mob. Today, I'm so excited to introduce you to a guest that I, I think we've been trying to connect for a while, so I'm really excited to do this. I have the one, the only, the oh-so-famous Mr. Frank Lopes in the house. Frank, what is going on? Oh, so famous. Ooh, easy with that, Jason. Easy. I'm already All right, clubhouse here. celebrity. Got... Let me just put that. We'll put clubhouse oh. celebrity. <laughs> oh, please. You don't have to do any more pumping for me to get here. I am here. And look, the fact that it's taken so long for the two of us to connect is 100% my fault, not your fault whatsoever, you know, because we've even been in places together at the it's same true. time. And, you know, just the way life is, different directions, you know, like birds flying around in the air. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here it's crazy the last time you know we saw each other was at nada and it I just so, it, it yeah. feels it feels like it was a decade ago and it's just like literally it's coming up i mean february is next week that's just it's just insane how a year has just just flown by like that just got uh, well look we we've everyone has been dramatically distracted over the past year okay. without a doubt so in some cases time seems that it stood still and it seems like oh my god we were just at nada yesterday right. and then in other cases you know within the same second you can have the feeling that that was like 21 years ago i know because crazy. we've all been through so much Hey, Frank, for everybody out there that's watching and listening right now and kind of don't know who you are and your background and how you kind of got started in the industry, I always like to start off these podcasts with a little origin story. So, you know, for everyone out there listening, what is the origin story that is? Well, for those of us that haven't met yet, it's my absolute pleasure to meet you. My name is Frank J. Lopes. I am the author of The Seven Minute Setup, which was recently featured in Forbes as one of the seven best investments you could make in 2021. Uh, I'm a keynote speaker. I am a basically lifelong alum of the automobile industry. I'm an automobile sales, uh, retail automotive sales strategist and marketing agent, vice president president of FB Digital. And Jason, I, I tell the story all the time and I have to tell it in, you know, I have to tell it in total honesty and total disclosure, which is I had an extremely dysfunctional childhood because <laughs> I grew up in a car dealership. At 11 years old, my father, who was a prep technician at a Lincoln Mercury dealership, in East Brunswick, New Jersey, at 11 years old, he started taking me to work with him. Now, this was in the early to mid 80s. So doing that type of thing was like totally OK at that time that you could like bring your kid to work, not just on bring your child to work day. Like this was like a Tuesday in the summer that I started going to work with him. And as soon as I as soon as I started doing so, I was immediately like addicted <laughs> to the to the dealership, to the hustle in the dealership, to the culture of the dealership. I basically grew up in, you know, in an automobile dealership. So I say it tongue in cheek, like in a lot of ways that 11 years old, I should not have been seeing and hearing the things that I saw and heard. And then at the same time, thank you, Jesus, for the fact that I did see and hear those things at such a young age, because it totally shaped my future and it paved the road and it did everything to open doors for where I am today. That is awesome. That is awesome. Hey, yeah, like, okay, so let's get into this. So, um, look, uh, what a year, you know, it's been a year since, you know, we were kind of in the same room and man, a crazy year. And, and I hate to say that there's a silver lining, you know, that has happened this year. But I think in our industry, there has been several positive things that have come about in COVID. Uh, things from operations to communications to even the, I, I think, the fast forwarding of digital transformation of our industry. But I would love to kind of get your thoughts. Well, like, where do you see a handful of positive things that have come out of this last year? Uh, Jason, there are so many positives. And, and look, I want to start off by saying that in no way, shape or form are we discounting any of the struggles or any of the trials mm -hmm. or handicaps or anything that so many of uh, so many world 
residents. So many humans right now have been put through when it comes to, you know, when it comes to COVID and what happened this past year and what we're still going through right now. But with that being said, at the same time in the automotive industry and also in a lot of industries, there are a tremendous amount of positive byproducts that came out of this pandemic. Okay, so these are not things that were intended to happen right away or anything like that. You could call them byproducts. You could call them side effects, right, of COVID. But there are so many great things. I mean, and I think the first one that that we should talk about is the fact that in automobile dealerships, I believe all over the world, in automobile dealerships, managers of those dealerships suddenly were given a totally fresh renewal and totally a fresh appreciation for, number one, the way that customers want to communicate with the dealership. Yeah. And number two, the importance of that communication. I think prior to COVID, a lot of managers were focused on the live body in front of them, ups in the showroom, and they weren't as focused as they should or could have been on incoming inquiries, incoming telephone calls, incoming chats. And in, especially in America, as soon as a lot of as states started to close down businesses in April and in May, and then as they started to shift the buying process over on dealerships, forcibly shifting it over to your showroom is closed, then to remote deliveries only, and then to showroom by appointment with social distancing and stuff. Managers like, bang, like that. They realized oh, how yeah. important it was like, oh, wow, nobody's walking in the door. So that if we don't work, the people that are reaching out to us through leads, inquiries, chats, telephone calls, we're not going to do anything. Like we're going to go, no. we're going to starve here. And, and you know what it is, is, you know, for years, you know, I, I think uh, us, we've been talking about the importance of our digital dealership and also the way that we connect to the customer in that digital way. And and I feel like it's kind of fallen on deaf ears and I hate to yes. say it, it sounds horrible, but it took a pandemic to literally kick us in the ass and say, okay, enough's enough. I'm going to care about this thing that's called a website. Now, look, there are some dealerships that have done phenomenal jobs of this for a long time. But I think just and there's a lot of our industry just kind of treated their website as just a digital brochure and, you know, force the like you were saying, force the customer to communicate our way, not their way. You know, so it, yes, it did. It took a pandemic to kick us in the ass, you know, and I and I do give our industry a lot of tough love. But I will actually have to admit, you know, we changed more in the last 12 months than we probably have yes. in the last 30 years combined. Do you agree? Yes, absolutely. And, and look, Jason, a lot of dealers, they're no different than any other business executives and business owners. OK, and the only time that for the majority of them, the only time that they suddenly realize how important their digital presence is. And when I say digital presence, I'm I'm casting a wide net here, yeah, like super, yeah. super wide. OK, the only way that they realize that their digital presence is is important is when they realize and when they gain appreciation for the inquiries and the chats and the telephone calls that are coming in because then the connection is like then the connection's made and they're saying oh my god these people are getting the phone number off the website these leads the, here's a lead right now right now here's an inquiry from a customer asking if we still have this car in stock came from our website mm -hmm. here's one on a used car that came from cars.com car gurus auto trader fill in the blank true car i don't i don't give a shit whichever one you want to put in there <laughs> but they suddenly were like oh wow there's a whole bunch of people out there that that are trying to get in right now that i can't even see when that and they're happens, real customers bang that's right? magic right there exactly you know what it's cool though in the real customers I mean, how often, I mean, I'm sure you've gotten this a lot too, you, you're speaking to dealers and we almost kind of talk about these, these internet customers as they're not like real people. They're just, so you know what I mean? They're just kind of it's, it's like, I don't know, they're fake, you know? So, but, but we had all of a sudden had to actually start taking it seriously. 
Like these were real people. We had to have real conversations. And I even found even in, in a lot of syntax, just the way that we're communicating with these people all of a sudden changes. I mean, look, I, th I don't think there's a dealer out there that would agree that templates are the way to go and the way to communicate. We actually have to have real conversations because these are real people. Are, are you seeing the same thing? Absolutely. And look, the template, I was, I was anti-templates for years and yeah. years and years and years. Okay. And then managers started answering leads. And then I was like, Oh boy, if there's ever been a time when, when we should be relying on the template. Okay. But relying on the template as a guide in what to say so that we don't miss certain things. You know, mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. the template as almost like a playbook on how do you reply to this lead? Make sure you acknowledge this. Make sure you say that. Make sure you read the goddamn lead in the first place and look and see if there's a question <laughs> on it and answer the question first. You know, if the customer asks for a price, give them a price. Don't try to jog, jockey around the price. Cover. If they ask, give. So I, I think, yeah, man, I think there's a, there's a tremendous amount of positive side effect or positive byproduct that occurred 100%, you know, thankful in a way, if, if you can be thankful to COVID for anything, be I thankful know. for, you know, be thankful for that. You know what, I, this kind of reminds me of uh, 2008, you know, where yes. as an industry, everything kind of got tightened up. Okay, like it wasn't enough just to be a car dealer. It wasn't enough to just throw out ads out there like you couldn't half ass your way to profitability anymore and i feel like you know it does take you know slowdowns or uh, of our industry to kind of i don't know filter out you know that the half asm ass ism that's a new word huh? <laughs> Uh, of our half, ass, half ass ism is half a great ass word. Ism, and, right? and Jason, I know exactly where you're going. Look, and Gary V talks all the time about peacetime generals versus wartime generals. Yep. You know, 100%. being probably the original Gary V student because I was Gary Vaynerchuk's advertising agent from 2004 to 2009. You know, I, I'm like student number one in, in of the book of Gary V, right? But he talks all the time about peacetime generals generals versus wartime generals. Okay. And generally the switch over from peacetime to wartime happens kind of gradually. A few events occur, right? A few things happen and you can see it's starting to trend, you know, from March 16th to March 17th, it was bang, peace to war. Yes, exactly. Instantly, o -o overnight. And the peacetime generals, they got smooshed really, really, really fast. You know, 100%. they're the ones that they're the ones that we know that they got furloughed and some of them are back and some of them are not. They're the ones that just sat there with, I don't know what to do. So they did nothing. There were the ones that totally reeled everything in mm -hmm. and just like shut down the dealership because they stuck their head, the ostrich with the head in the sand type of thing, because they don't know what in the world to do. And then the wartime generals, they all realized somewhere in the vicinity of March 18th to March 20th, they all realized, you know what? You know what we do? We sell and service automobiles. And short of a nuclear bomb going off and destroying <laughs> everything around us, people are still going to need to, to have their vehicles serviced because they're still going to need transportation. They're going to need reliable transportation. So they're going to need their vehicle serviced. Some of them are going to still need to purchase a new vehicle or a new to them vehicle. They're going to need to upgrade the vehicle that they currently have. And that matches in alignment 100% with what we do. So we got to figure out how to do what we do with this, you know, with this obstacle in our way. I make the joke all the time that, you know, it, that car dealers are like rats and cockroaches, right? <laughs> okay. And no matter what happens, no matter what goes on, the rat is going to find food and the cockroach is going to survive no matter what. The strong ones are going to survive. And this was a rat and cockroach moment. That, in that beginning, you know, that middle of March, especially since Jason, I don't know about you, but I don't know one car dealer that was not having a banner March up until like the 17th or 16th of the month. Oh, no, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, it was it was it was absolutely amazing. You know, so the you know, so the the 
the wartime generals, they took off their fancy hats. You know, they took off their fancy jackets and everything. They put on those war helmets. You know what I'm talking about? Those round war helmets. They put them Mm -hmm. on. They put on their headsets for communication. They came in dressed in their war gear, which is basically whatever. And they got into it right away. And they are the ones that you see, Jason, you know it. They're the ones who catapulted up and out of this. And at the same time, everyone else who suddenly was like, maybe around March 26th, we're like, shit, we got to do something. They're like, oh, crap, what's going to happen? You know, the the funny thing is, look, I... I love the way that you're describing these wartime generals because I'm, 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 I can picture it in my head and I can actually see a handful of those wartime generals that, that I currently work with or even have recently met. And the one thing that I find consistent with all of them is that when, when it comes to being a wartime general and, they're t- and it's time to go to war, it, it's, their, their process is, is insanely stellar. So, it, mm. it, you know, it's like there, there are leaders of people and then there are leaders of process. And they're entirely different types of generals. And I'm I'm seeing right now, and I'm curious to see if you're seeing the same thing, is that if, if in your dealership you have a leader of process, you guys are crushing it right now. And I, th- I feel like it's that time, similar to back in 2008, where we're going to have to process our way to profitability. But it's like, wh- where do you start? And I'm curious if you're seeing the same thing. In my opinion, in the automotive industry, there are two things, right? There are two individual instances or entities, which are the undisputed heavyweight champ okay, <laughs> of results. Yep. One of them is the market. The market will always dictate whether you are relevant and whether you are serving the market or not. It will it, undefeated, no matter what. If you are doing a good job, it will catapult you up. If you're doing a bad job, it'll squish you down super, super fast. And the other one, which I think in some ways dictates the market, the other one is your process. Your process is the undisputed heavyweight champ, undefeated, mm-hmm. undisputed mm-hmm. heavyweight champ of the success of your business, without a doubt. If your process is tight, if your process is followed, if your process is being taught, if your process is being inspected, all of the old isms, right? expect you know inspect what you expect the process the <laughs> yep. the magic is in the process the, the, all those isms exist because they're freaking true man because they're true you know 100%. but so many they let the process go they don't even have a process they've got a half ass process you know and they're they're operating all the time just out of gut reaction they are the ones that go up and down with the tide they get thrown around when the storm comes they get thrown out of the boat they drown or they got to try to swim back or some shit no matter what but the process the process the process and that is where the profit is it's always in the process you can't sell cars effectively in today's market if you do not have a process that is rock solid and at the same time that you are examining and that you keep flexible to be able to adjust oh, and mon- to monitor and adjust as time goes on and, and that's very that's very true like I, I find some of the best processes out there um they, they have to be flexible and usually the, the, that process that are that's currently working for them is not version one it's like version 14 um, yes. Because they have that mentality, I, I, I'm amazed how often, though, uh, you know, I don't think I don't think necessarily we train our management or leadership on how to create process. It's like they, they'll, they'll create it. Sometimes they'll live only in their head, which is scary. Or maybe they'll get at least far enough to actually document it, but then it falls short because we don't figure out how we're going to measure the effectiveness of the process. And only right. when we're able to measure the effectiveness of the process can we work from version one to version fourteen. And, you know, I, I see that in some of the most successful dealerships out there. And I talk to a lot of dealerships about process development. And I guess the question I have for you is the question I get asked a lot is, OK, there are 162 processes in my dealership. You're telling mm-hmm. me I need to profit my way to process. OK, I, 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 I can buy into that. I get it. Where do I start? And I would love to kind of get your thoughts. Like, what, like out of all these processes we have in the dealership, where, where would you tell a manager to start? So I would start immediately with the current results. Okay. When you look at the results of your dealership, you will be able to find all of the clues 
to the holes in the process. It always, it always happens. The proof is always there. That's why with the stores that I work with intimately, Jason, I create something that's called every month. I create for them something that's called an opportunity report. And that opportunity report breaks down by individual lead source, right? Every lead that has come into the store, the contact percentage, how many appointments we set, That's awesome. how many appointments we confirmed, how many appointments showed up, how many of those appointments that showed up bought a car, how many showroom visits we got off of those leads that were generated, how many vehicles we sold, what our visit closing percentage is, what our lead to sold is, what the total amount of vehicles we sold from that source, what that percentage is. And then we break that down to telephone, we break that down to walk-ins, Right. And by looking at that, I, I call it the blood test as well. You know how you go to the doctor yeah. and they order blood <laughs> and then the test comes back and there's like a gazillion are. things on there. And you're like on Google, like, what does SDL mean? Oh, my God, am I going to die? Right. <laughs> so it, it's it, it's the same type of thing. If you don't have the blood test, the doctor cannot even begin to prescribe any type of medication or any type of treatment plan for you. There is no manager on the face of the earth that can properly adjust the process or build the process or critique the process without looking at the blood test of the dealership. And a lot of deal, a lot of managers are like, Frank, I know what's going on. Or oh, it's my store. I know what's going on, Frank. Now, look, you just bring them in. All right. Your job is to bring you bring them in. I'll sell them. And you pull Billy Bob's opportunity report and his lead to sold is 4.1%. And his visit closing percentage is 31%. You know, and then you're like, oh, okay, Billy Bob, I love you, buddy, and I'm here to help you. But here's he, he, what n problem number one: what you think is going on and what's actually going on are two totally different things. Two entirely so different things. You know what I feel like I need on this board? I feel like I need like a mic drop, but we'll do like maybe one of those. There we go. That's, I wonder what kind that's... of sound the mic drop would be. Would it be like a? Yeah, I think like, that's what would it be. It'd be, be just that? like a like I don't. Yeah, I don't know, but you're right. You do. You do need some type of a the but, cheering works. But, but but no, but that but look, you hit it. I mean, that's that's you knocked that right out of the park. I mean, that is the place to start. I mean, I'm working with a lot of dealerships right now and kind of wrapping up their year end and reviewing everything and looking at the stats. I mean, we're seeing twice as much online engagement. We're seeing I mean, I have dealer groups that have processed two to three times more Internet leads than they did the previous year with less results. And I think that's one of the best places to start is get yourself a health check. Right. Yes. Make, make sure yes. make sure that your process is actually healthy against the actual stats. And and I think that's an amazing place to start. And but here's the kicker, though. Here's the kicker. And I'm finding this and I bet you might might see the same thing is that Instead of taking the time to create that health check and then develop out a routine, a workout routine to get healthier, a process to get healthier, mm -hmm. all right, we look for a freaking magic pill. And it's like, we want a <sighs> diet pill. We, we, we look, look, I, I need to lose 20 pounds. I'm not sure about you. I need to lose 20 pounds. And, you know, I, it, I would I would be lying if to say I, I didn't think about it for a second. I'm like, hmm, is there is there a quicker, faster way for me to do this? And of course, there isn't. I have to commit to the process. I have to commit to the routine. And I'm but I'm seeing this a lot right now. Everyone's searching for this this magic pill or, you know, or, or in our industry, we call it a widget that's going to come yeah. in and save the day. And I'm curious, are you seeing the same thing? I'm seeing the same thing. And friends, let me tell you right now, okay, if you haven't listened to anything on the show yet, this is the part that you want to listen to right now. Okay, friends, we go. there is no magic pill. There's no silver bullet. Okay, there is no Jesus of the widget world that's going to come to your dealership and save you. I love it's that. not good. It's not going to happen because it does not exist. Look, you're hearing it from one of the premier authorities in automotive retail. Jason has also said it so, so many times. I deal with stores all over the United States, stores that sell 1, 1,000, 1,200 cars a month, stores that sell 120 cars a month. Okay. And there is no magic pill that takes the, a store from 120 to 1,200. It is a it is a series. It is a, a group. It is a formulation of 
a ton of different steps of hard mm-hmm. work, of self-awareness, of realization, of looking in the mirror and being totally honest with yourself that you suck at X, Y, and Z. <laughs> and what are you going to do to improve that? You're great at A, B, and C. What are you going to do to give that even more power? and exploit that even more. There is no digital retailing widget. There is no trade tool. There is no coupon tool. All of those things just at best, they will add to your opportunities, okay? But if you don't put in the hard Mm -hmm. work and the good work with those opportunities, all you're going to do is create a bigger mess and have less money at the end of the month on the statement because you've invested money into these tools that you thought were the were the John the Baptist or the savior or the Jesus of your dealership. Jesus it's widgets. not going to work. The savior and the deal the savior and the Jesus of the dealership is the guy that you see or the gal that you see when you wake up in the morning and you go to the mirror. That person looking back at you, that's your savior. You know what? I love Not that. some stupid widget. No, it's it's being honest with yourself, right? And and look, it, it's no different than me being honest with myself and wanting to lose that twenty pounds and and reach that goal was just being serious about just being serious with myself. Now, now here's the thing, though. I realized for myself that it's a, this is a mindset game because I find it yes. it's too easy to go and instead of taking the time. Uh, and the effort to maintain that mindset that I'm going to, you know, profit my way out or process my way to profitability. It is so easy just to, you know, uh, for a vendor to come in and say, well, look at the results that these guys are having. And it's only five ninety nine a month. And it's just a simple piece of code that goes on your website and you're going to get in all these trade in leads. It's, it is so easy to default back to that mindset of this quick diet pill or silver bullet or this Jesus widget. By the way, I love the Jesus widget thing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to use that one. But, but how, how do we maintain that mindset? I guess that's my question for you. How do we get ourselves into that mindset that it's like, it's not a widget that's going to save me. I need to save myself. Number one, you can use Jesus for any type of polarizing uh, uh, um, comparison that you want. He's totally okay with it as long as you put him in a positive light. It's totally, you know, totally, totally good. Um, How do you do it? Well, you you, you, number one, you have to decide. You you have to decide that the Mm -hmm. current the current state of your business, of your sales department, your service department, of your dealership in the whole, you have to decide that the current state is not good enough. You have to realize that each and every single dealership okay, in the world can do more. Hell you yeah. can sell more vehicles, you can service more vehicles, you can generate more gross revenue, and you can also generate more net profit. At any store, I don't care who it is, you can do more. Once you decide that you, A, you realize that you can do more, and B, you decide that you want to do more, okay, then it's time to sit down, like we said earlier, take a full evaluation of what's going on in your store, take a full deep evaluation, look at the spots that need improvement, and immediately set goals, set goals that of, of improvement that you want to reach. Okay. If you're, if your internet department, or I'm just using an example, if your internet or or internet department or BDC, if you're currently running at, let's say a a 18% appointment set ratio, right? So the amount of appointments that you set divided into the amount of good leads that you have for the month. If you're at 18%, set a goal for 25%. Okay. If 40% of those appointments are showing up, set the goal for 60. If you're confirming like most dealerships, Mm -hmm. if you're confirming somewhere around 15 to 30% of your appointments, and that's only because a manager is clicking the confirmed button by accident with his mouse because he's going across the screen too fast. You know, if, if that's what's going on, set a goal to hit 70% appointment confirmations. Set a goal for yourself that you know the behavior of achieving those goals is going to 
the byproduct of which is going to be that all of your performance numbers are going to increase. Once mm -hmm. your performance numbers increase, then your opportunities, your live opportunities increase. Once your live opportunities increase, then Billy Bobism kicks in. Okay. And you close, mo I close everybody that comes in, Frank, you start closing more deals and you wind up selling more cars. It sounds very, very simple because it is. Well, the it, it, theory it is, of it is not complicated. It, it's the execution not, is hard. That, I was going to say, there you go. That's where it is. It's, it's the execution of it, right? And, and I find sometimes the execution just starts in the development of the goal. You know, look, right. look, I'm, look we, we have widgets. You know, we, we sell marketing tools and, you know, we, we, we are a widget seller. We have a website solution. Look, we, we do that. But I spend more of my time when I get on the phone with a client talking about their goals and objectives and understanding those. And I because I feel like. We are way too quick to develop a process, to buy a widget, to invest into a tool, assuming that that process widget or tool is going to give us a goal. But it, instead, right. I, I, I want to spend more time with the client developing out the goals and then reverse engineer and go backwards towards right. the widget, towards the tool, towards, towards the process. And how are those widget tools and processes ultimately going to get me to my goal? But, but, but I find right now with goals in our industry, they're almost all operationally based. I, I split goals into three categories and I want to get your thoughts on this. Um, mm -hmm. is I, I think every dealership needs to have a experience goal, a culture goal, and an operations goal. And all of these have to kind of coexist at the exact same time. So when I go to develop out a process or invest in a widget or buy into a tool, it's like all three of these goals need to need to match into one of those one of those tools. But I want to get your thoughts as far as goal development. Well, uh, the goal development, no matter what, it's just like a pay plan development. The goal development must be aimed towards the result, right? That the dealership needs. Always it needs the same way how the pay plan in every single dealership should be adjusted according to the needs of the dealership itself. Okay. And, and the, mm -hmm. like that, because we know that every automotive person works their pay plan. Okay. That the, and the ones that don't are the ones that we honestly don't want to keep. We want to send them to target or to Walmart. That's where they'll be better off. So the, if you adjust the pay plan based on the goals that the dealership needs and those goals based on the behavior that you need out of your salespeople, out of your BDC representatives, out of your managers. Okay. If you adjust it like that, it always winds up working out that either a, they fake the pay plan or B they work the pay plan to be able to achieve the goals. The, now you got to go, like you said, Jason, you got to go one step back. Mm -hmm. Okay. You got to go one step back and say, okay, in my goals, to achieve because it's always oh i just want to sell more cars of course no 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 no, no, no. Metal. Not, <laughs> selling cars is the byproduct it's well the said. side effect selling cars is the byproduct of a solid process a solid customer experience right and a healthy culture a healthy relationship family relationship within the dealership all the time. And every store can improve on every single one of those aspects. Which one is going to produce the best byproduct or the best result for you? That's what you have to decide. And anybody, Jason, anybody that sits here, okay, mm -hmm. or in the, on a level like this and tries to tell uh, with a broad stroke what those things should be is out of their friggin' mind. Because it's going to be different <laughs> so for each and every store. It's it, going it to be is. different. That's like, you know, Don Rickles has this this funny thing, right? Where like he he's, wherever he runs into a doctor, or, or he used to say, because he's passed away, but whenever he runs into a doctor, he's always like, it hurts me when I do this. <laughs> what does that mean? Right? That could mean a thousand different things. And that's what's so lewd. That's why the joke is so good because everybody's like, oh my God, that could mean so much. It could be this finger. It could be this arm. It could be your elbow. It could be your shoulder. So many different things. So anybody who sits up here and gets that big wide brush out and starts saying, oh, you can't sell any cars <laughs> yeah. this day today if you don't have digital retailing and sports the paint on you. 
they're full of shit. They're 100% That's the bottom full line. Of shit. They're full of shit. I was in a room the other day. I almost had to call someone out for that exact thing, right? And but here's the cool thing, though, is like, look, as an industry, I think we've done a very good job over the years developing our operational uh, goals and objectives. And now I'm actually beginning to like even the conversation we were in just before we jumped on this recording. How much of that conversation was about branding? So now we're getting experience goals developing at the dealership and then working back towards the widgets or tools. And then we're also, in some cases, I had some conversations, now we get culture goals. Like, does this trade-in widget match what my culture goals are? And I'm just like, this is, I gotta be honest with you, I'm excited for the next five years because these are conversations that I've been wanting to have for the last 10 years. And honestly, I've just been kind of just brushed off as, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, that's great, that's great, but we, we just need to sell more fucking cars. Yeah. And look, the, the, the one thing that I would employ all dealerships to do, okay, is to look at your why buy, look at the reason Hell why, yeah. Absolutely. Okay? why should someone buy a car from your store? And if you're looking at the, well, we've been in business for seven to five years, Frank, if you're looking at the, we got Wi-Fi, we got Wi-Fi, right? If you're looking <laughs> at those types of things, you know, you're looking at it wrong. It's got to be a what is in it for the customer type of an approach. Now, look, if you're in Texas or if you're in Alberta or if you're in Ontario or if you're in Buffalo, it may change based on that region. Okay, if you're in New York City, it may be completely different than if you're in Orlando or Denver. So this is why I'm saying that big brush approach, it does. It's bullshit. It does not work. It's the foundation. It's the principles, right? It's all of the, it's all of the foundational stuff that leads to you discovering what is best for your store in your area, which leads to what is the best process to be able to fulfill that need, that customer's desire and customer's need. Most of the time, it's not even a desire. It's a need. Right, that comes up geographically, um, you know, uh, based on where, uh, based on their living condition, right? So many different, so many different things. A city resident is completely different than a suburb, mm-hmm, completely mm-hmm. different than rural, right? They have different needs and wants and whatnot and desires. And that's, that's where the magic is. When you sit down and you really unpeel that and you get down to like the brass roots, you know, the, the grass roots of it that that's where the magic is. Like I'll share a quick story if, if that's okay, Jason. Absolutely. One of the, I have a, uh, I have a Subaru dealership that I work with that's in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. In, in New York city. Mm-hmm. And prior to COVID, we were talking about how inconvenient at times it is to get from one end of Brooklyn to the other end of Brooklyn, or to get from Manhattan into Brooklyn or Queens or Long Island into Brooklyn. And when you look at it on a map, it seems like the dealership could pull from any one of the five boroughs. And then when you look into reality, there's a bridge here. There's an airport that creates a tremendous amount of traffic here. There's a bridge and a tunnel here. There are, you have to go across 15 million people to get to he, to get to the dealership from here. So I am, I employed the, uh, the idea of let's start to offer that will bring the car to the customer's house. Let's start mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. offer that we will do deliveries at home. Let's start to offer those things because somebody from Staten Island is like, do I really have to go over the bridge? Do I got to pay the, I got to pay $18 <laughs> to go look in the car. What's this, right? So instead, let's bring the car to the customer. So he doesn't have to go over the bridge. So he doesn't have to sit in the traffic. Let's sit in the traffic. Let's take the let's take mm-hmm. the pain of the process and put it on ourselves and make it easier for the customer. I love that. So they start they started to do that. They started to offer it in lead response. They started to offer it as an alternative, almost as an objection handle when they would you know when they would say, "Hey, are you available to come in at on Saturday to test drive the Outback? I've got two fifteen and four forty five available." And the customer, potential customer would say, yeah, well, you know, I got to go to Home Depot and then my kids got soccer and then I got to take the dog to the vet and I got to take the dog to the groomers because he rolled around with a skunk outside and he <laughs> stinks. Right. And immediately right at that second to say, hey, you know, I can we can bring the car to you. 
And that silence is what, yeah, that silence is what happens. And I tell them when you hear that silence, that's when you just, you just pulled a rabbit out of the, out of a hat. And and so you know what I love about that story is that, you know, it really, you know, fulfills, I think for a lot of dealerships, their culture goal, all right, of of providing convenience and wanting to be customer centric and the experience goal. I mean, come on, that's, that's an experience in a box right there, right? And then the operational goal, that kind of fulfills all of them. But kind of what we were talking about earlier, and you said it very, very eloquently, is it's the foundation, right? If you don't have these goals, all right, and you hear this story and you're like, that's a good idea. By the way, I, I hate good ideas. I truly do, all right? Whenever <laughs> whenever I go into a meeting with someone or a manager and I'm just, they're like, hey, Jay, I got a good idea. I'm like, oh, oh God, here, it comes. here we go. Um, now, what I love to hear is like, hey, I got a goal. Right. Here's my goal. This is yes. what I want to do. And then let me work backwards towards that because because good ideas aren't typically rooted in a goal. And, but that's what we're talking about. This is the, you know what? If, if you're literally listening and watching to this right now, you know what me and Frank have talked about, it all comes down to how Frank said it, the foundation of the goals. You're not going to process your way to profitability if you don't have that foundation. You're, you're not going to act, you know, uh, use the widgets or the tools uh, that are out there properly if you don't have that foundation of the goal. And you're not going to be able to achieve an experience like you like you just said if that's not truly a part of your goal. Now, I, I know it's towards the tail end of our time, uh, Frank, but before I let you go though, because this conversation has been awesome. And I, I, for everyone out there that's watching and listening and would love to kind of you know, continue to have this conversation or continue to you know, connect with you and follow along with your journey, w- what's the best way to do so? So the, uh, the best way to do so is to just go to Google and type in my name, Frank J. Lopes. You'll find multiple ways to get in touch with me, um, either through Facebook or through Clubhouse or LinkedIn or anything like that. If you want direct connection to me, you can join my texting crew. So what my texting crew does is I send out a daily text message to everyone who follows me in the text crew. And uh, it's motivational, inspirational. It's always something that's good for so good for the recipient. It's very, very rare mm, that I am cool. using um, that I'm using it for self promotion or anything like that. I'm all about giving and everything. If you want to join the text crew, all you got to do is text me at seven three two five six one. 1854. The texts go directly to my phone. I see them here. They don't go to some spam bot or they don't go to some, you know, Taiwanese uh, (laughs) BDC center or something. Nothing against anybody who's from Taiwan, but you know, nobody, nobody listening to this really wants that. So you can find, uh, you can find me anywhere there. You can join my text, uh, my text club, my text crew. And also you can buy my book, Right here, the seven minute setup. This is actually one Great of the book. one of the first edition ones. The new ones have a different cover, but they look almost exactly the same. And you can grab the book at seven minute setup book.com. And Jason, whenever anybody starts to talk about goals or goal setting or achieving goals, you know, mm-hmm. that's what I wrote this book for. And that's exactly what this book is about. And, and this book is for it's the actual process that I built and that I used that brought me from bankruptcy to the condition that I am in today, which not to be big or anything, but it's pretty good, (laughs) right? And I'm gonna use it to continue to grow to heights that everyone is gonna see. And honestly, Jason, whenever anybody starts to talk about goals and stuff, you know, either one of two things happens. Either I start to like drool a little bit out of the side of my mouth, (laughs) like, oh, really? Or I, I bite my lip like, Ooh, this is good. Like, let's go. You know, so I could talk about goals all day long, man, all day. But if you want to get in touch with me, I would absolutely love that. Join the text crew, 732-561-1854, right? Reach out to me on social, on direct messages, on Facebook, Clubhouse, Instagram, LinkedIn, you name it, <laughs> or you can get right into right into the noggin here by going and buying the book, the seven minute setup, seven minute setup book.com. It's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, a whole bunch of places that you can buy books. You can download it. Awesome. That is so awesome. And and, and I really encourage people to go out there because talk about some amazing resources. Uh, the, the texting platform is, is amazing. That, that that book, it's an easy read. I remember I got a copy of it last year at NADA. Uh, I think I actually read it on the flight back, that's how fast, and it, but it was good. It was, and you're 100% right. If you've listened to this conversation, 
and you're like, yeah, I got to take that next steps. I got to get serious about my creating my foundational goals. You got to hook up with Frank. There's some awesome resources. Hey, Frank, thank you so much for taking the time to jam with me today. This has been an amazing conversation. Uh, you, you have yourself an amazing day. You too, Jason. Thank you so much. I apologize for the delay no. in us getting together, but I think we chopped it up super fine today. And I know I'm hoping that everybody got a tremendous amount of value out of this because that's really what that's what it's all about. Absolutely. They did. Thanks, Frank. Okay. Thank you, man. Thanks for tuning in to the Strategy Mob Podcast with your host, Jason Harris. Don't want to miss new content? Be sure to sign up to be a mobster at strategymob.com to stay in the know. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. 